Thank you for joining me. I'm Julie Ballou, and this is Rape the Podcast. If you find yourself triggered by anything in this podcast, I urge you to call 1-800-656-HOPE or visit rain.org. That's rain with two N's. In the last episode, I told you about the case file from Springfield, Missouri that was exposed by CNN reporters in a web article in 2018. What has happened since 108 rape kits were destroyed by Springfield police before the statute of limitations ran out is the story that is driving this podcast. In this episode, you'll hear the apology from Chief Paul Williams of the Springfield Police Department, and we're talking with survivors of rape. I've noticed how resilience is something they all have in common, while their stories are all so different. I talked with Shannon, a brave local survivor who wanted to tell her story. First of all, uh, why did you decide to share your story? I think it, it happens to so many women, and especially the earlier generations of women, probably before my generation. It was something you shut up, you, you kept quiet. And today, as society moves forward, it progresses. I think there's lessons that can be learned from people that have been through it. We want to make it not as taboo to talk about. I grew up in a really abusive environment. My mother was beyond less than loving, to say the least. My father wasn't fabulous by any stretch of the imagination, but he did love me, and he loved me dearly. At 13, I no longer wanted to live with my mom. And I told her I wanted to move in with my dad. And she said, oh, call him. He doesn't want you anyways, but you can feel free to call him. And he came and got me. I was living with my dad, my stepmom, my three stepsisters, and then their grandmother. And my oldest stepsister, who was 15 at the time, was engaged to be married to a gentleman that was 22. It didn't take long, and he started raping me. The fiancé raped you? Yes, yes. Okay. My stepsister's now husband. They're still married to this day. And how old were you? I was 13. Was this your first experience with sex? I had kissed one boy. I was 13 years old and I had only kissed one boy. Tell me about what happened. Yeah, I can absolutely tell you. The first time, my dad, my stepmom, and the grandmother were all three at work, and it was just me and him in the house. And he kept kind of bothering me, and I kept telling him to leave me alone, leave me alone. And he finally, he kind of got to the point where he was able to pick me up and carry me up the stairs. He carried me to my stepsister's room, the bed that he slept in every night with the girl that he was supposed to marry that was only 15 years old. And I remember looking out the window that was directly above my head. And I kept telling him, I said, well, what if somebody comes home? What if the neighbors see? What if if somebody finds out? You know, we'll both be in trouble. There's no reason to do this. And I argued. I put my knees up to my chest. I pushed. I did everything I could to make it not happen. And then I realized that it it was futile. It was going to happen. I liked it or not. And I had to make the the choice to at least have as least damage to my body as possible. How did you deal with it afterwards? Did you tell anyone? I went and sat in the bathtub for a long time, and I scrubbed, and I scrubbed, and I I cleaned myself, and I cleaned some more, and I just felt filthy. And then I remember I looked at myself in the bathroom, and I was looking at myself, and I was so ugly. I was just... I can't describe how ugly you feel in that moment, how badly you want to be anybody but you. And I proceeded to cut my hair off. Hmm. You didn't tell your dad or your sister or anyone? I told nobody. How did that affect your relationship going forward? 
I have a very minimal relationship with my father. I have no relationship with my stepmother. I have no relationship with my three stepsisters. This environment and this home that I had just gotten to was supposed to be my salvation. It was supposed to be my saving grace and my normalcy and my environment of people that love me. And it immediately turned into this awful thing. And by the end of it all, when I did turn them in, it became a group of people that hated me. Did you have boyfriends after that? I kept it to myself for a while. Um, He ended up getting a hold of me six times. The worst one I remember was everybody was in the house sleeping, and I had strep throat, and I was running a fever, and I was sick, and my dad had taken me to the doctor, and I was sleeping downstairs on the couch with strep throat, and he came down and raped me while everybody was in the house. Eventually, I had to choose, you know, between staying there and saying nothing or going back to my mom. And what did you decide to do? I would rather be physically abused than sexually abused. I went home to my mom. It's your mom? Yeah. Did you try to block it out? Had you um, you go through counseling? Or when when did you decide that this was something that you needed to face, if ever? It wasn't long. I think I had been back home with my mom for... I'm sure it was less than six months, and it was the day that him and my stepsister were getting married, and I knew that they would be out of town because they were going on their honeymoon, and I told because I was afraid that he would start abusing my other sister, and I didn't want her to go through what I went through because she had long blonde hair like me, a similar similar body figure, we were both athletic, all of those types of things. So that's what I told. And what was their reaction? He was charged. Oh, wow. That is impressive. Well, it comes less impressive. He pled up to the charges. He ended up pleading guilty to sex with a minor um, statutory rape. And he was provided two years of unsupervised probation and two and with an SIS. So he has no record. But this is not the rape that you had a rape kit for. You had a rape kit done. What happened there? So as life went on, are we recording right now? Yes, we are. As life went on, I had no concern for myself, my body. And it was just completely and totally evident that Certain people in this world are going to do what they want, regardless of what you say or what you do. And I had turned to stripping and prostitution. And I was on a call one night, and I was brutally raped. I think that they discovered he had bitten me at least 12 times, bit me, like holding me down and biting me. He had raped me. He had sodomized me. And again, I went home, and I cleaned, and I cleaned, and I cleaned. And I waited for days before I went to the hospital, and they did do a rape kit. And I told the doctor that I refuse. I will not press charges. I will not testify. I'm not coming forward. And I know that they got the kit, and I remember the doctor screaming at me that he was going to do this to another girl, and it was going to be my fault. What was the process like for you to go through that? It was humiliating because I had already had to testify once and nothing was done. I mean, two years of unsupervised probation and an SIS, what a joke. Why would I come for it a second time? I mean, are you kidding me? And that's why you didn't pursue anything the second time because nothing happened the first time. Absolutely. Absolutely. How long ago was this? Wow. I was raped as a child when I was 13. I'm trying to think back. I was married when I was 27. I was 25 or 26 years old. Was this in Springfield or 
Grand County, Missouri. It was Franklin, Grand Missouri. Mm-hmm. So you never had any contact with the police, just the doctors in the hospital? That's correct. Did anyone ever follow up with you? No. Was there ever an advocate assigned or, or involved? No. No. How do you feel now about that? Do you think that you should have gone to the police? No. Why? No. I wasn't going to be victimized on the stand like I had been so long ago. Never. Mm Mm-mm. And especially doing what I was doing with children in the middle of a divorce. If it would have came out, I would have lost my kids. It would have been on display for the entire world to see. And I would definitely not be where I am in life today. So you feel comfortable that you did the right thing for you? Based on my previous experience, it was the right decision for me. Right. Do you have any idea where this guy is now? Which one? Well, either one of them, I guess. One lives in Republic or Missouri. He has three children and a grandchild. Still married to my sister. Married to your sister. Wow. And I can see why you don't have any contact with your family. Yeah. I mean, he got two years of probation, and I got a life sentence. This is a clear example of someone having a bad experience with the police, lawyers, the justice system. Of course she's not going to go through that another time. The trauma of that experience might have even been tantamount to the rape itself. I'm Springfield Chief of Police Paul Williams. You may have seen or heard of a recent news story about the past practices of the Springfield Police Department regarding the handling of a very sensitive subject, sexual assault. It's a serious issue in our community and in our country. The Springfield Police Department takes full responsibility for what we now know as mistakes in our handling of past sexual assault cases, particularly with regard to the testing for disposal of evidence contained in sexual assault kits. To the victims of sexual assault and their families who may have been affected by these past mistakes, we sincerely apologize. SPD remains committed to testing all sexual assault kits and retaining the evidence indefinitely. As a victim-centered, trauma-informed law enforcement agency, we understand the importance of recognizing the impact of trauma, the influence of societal myths and stereotypes, and the need to work at a pace comfortable for victims in order to provide an effective response. Treating victims appropriately is just as important as holding offenders accountable. When you know better, you do better. Since changing our policies in 2014, SPD has been a leading law enforcement agency that employs best practices for preparing sexual assault cases for successful prosecution. In addition, we continue to partner with service providers in the community to provide a holistic response to all victims of sexual assault. Approximately one in three women and one in six men have experienced sexual assault in their lifetime, and almost seven in 10 sexual assault victims never report their victimization to the police you have been a victim of sexual assault and have not come forward, I encourage you to contact us and assure you the Springfield Police Department will investigate your report thoroughly and completely. If you have reported a sexual assault in the past and are concerned that your case was not investigated appropriately, I encourage you to contact the Springfield Police Department and we will address your concerns. Thank you. We've had too many stories about bad police practices a lot lately. You need to know what's wrong in order to fix the problem. Just like AA, the first step is admitting that you have a problem. This apology from Chief Williams was combined with admitting the CNN article was true. And what I hear in his apology is a little guilt, a little shame. I also hear a strong desire to get the community to understand that it's important for Chief Williams to get it right, thanks to the changing panorama of rape in really only recent society. It's called a movement, 
And there's been so much movement since the phrase Me Too was intentionally used in 2006 by Tarana Burke, an American activist from the Bronx in New York. Over a decade later, actress Alyssa Milano turned it into a hashtag in response to everything that was going down with Harvey Weinstein's sexual assault accusations. When we hear about how police officers and departments treat rape victims, it's totally understandable why someone who went through enough trauma from the rape wouldn't want to endure the disappointment or seemingly lack of empathy by reporting the incident to police and going through that whole process. And then there's the road down Justice Lane that more often than not leads to a dead end. Telling these awful stories like the one that CNN exposed and the one we just heard from Shannon, well, that can contribute to a victim's reason not to report. I spoke to Brandy Allen, executive director of the local victim center soon after the Springfield City Council started the sexual assault task force. And she said, Julie, you have to understand that three out of four rapes aren't even reported to police. That means there's other reasons that rapes aren't reported. It's not just about holding the police accountable. It's about holding the entire community accountable. Rain.org lists reasons victims choose to report or not. They use statistics from the National Crime Victimization Survey. It's an annual survey conducted by the Justice Department. There's going to be a lot of statistics in this podcast, so it's important that you know where they come from. I've linked to these sources at rapethepodcast.com. So of the sexual violence crimes reported to police from 2005 to 2010, the survivor reporting gave the following reasons for doing so. 28% said to protect the household or a victim from further crimes by the offender. 25% said to stop the incident or prevent recurrence or escalation. 21% said to improve police surveillance or they believe they had a duty to do so. 17% said to catch, punish, or prevent offender from reoffending. 6% gave a different answer or declined to cite one reason. And 3% did so to get help or recover loss. Of the sexual violence crimes not reported to police from 2005 to 2010, the victim gave the following reasons for not reporting. 20% feared retaliation. 13% believed that the police wouldn't do anything to help. 13% believed it was a personal matter. 8% reported to a different official. 8% believed it was not important enough to report. 7% did not want to get the perpetrator in trouble. 2% believed the police could not do anything to help. And 30% gave another reason or did not cite a reason. Now we're going to hear from a friend of mine from high school. It's weird to talk to somebody after, I don't know how many decades. Oh, my God, 30 years, because I'm 48. We graduated. Didn't we graduate the same year? 88. I graduated in 88. 30 years then. 30 <laughs> years. Yeah. 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 After I left high school, I did not talk to anyone either. Like, I lost contact with everybody. Me too. I didn't really have any interest in following up with anybody. (laughs) No, I didn't either. I didn't. I mean, well, that's not true. I had a couple of friends that I stayed in contact with for a few years. But then I moved around and just, you know. And life happened. And uh, it's hard when she, especially... Well, I just had such a different life from high school. Once I started having kids, that definitely was just like, I don't know. And then Facebook came along, and it's weird because exactly my Facebook friends are not exactly my friends from high school, you know, but yeah, I'm so glad to be in touch with them. Like, we've become... I know. It's weird. I know. (laughs) I know. It is so weird. But, you know... So I guess that what I would say like was that twelve years ago? Yeah, I don't remember exactly. I don't know. I didn't get on Facebook when it was first on, and then my cousin Chad, he and I lived together when I was in college, and 
we're very, he's actually a year or two younger than me. We were close growing up because his sister and then Suzanne and I were all like the same age. And so we just, I didn't even talk to people from, from uh, college anymore at that point. Except for him, of course, because he's family. And it was so great because I was I like, I've forgotten all these people that I actually yeah. knew. I like, right. forgot that I knew them. And had a history with them, too. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I wish I could hear the stories that people can remember of me because I don't remember them. And I could tell them stories that I remember of them that they don't remember. We could put our yeah. memories together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Figure out what happened in high school. Well, um, are you ready to talk about yeah. Story. Yeah, absolutely. first of all, where are you now exactly? I um, live in Indiana, Evansville, Indiana. Indiana. Okay. Mm-hmm. And when did this happen? I was 13, almost 14. It took me a long time to actually, you know, when you have something that's really traumatizing, you, your survival mechanism is to try and pretend it didn't happen and to squash it and put it back, back your memory and forget about it. That's how you move forward. At the time, I had – my parents divorced when I was really young, and my upbringing, childhood parents, you know, typical 70s, 80s, like latchkey kids, divorced parents, and I think Gen X parents really didn't pay attention to their kids. And so they were not good parents. I'll just say that. It was uh, – my stepfather was, like, emo- emotionally and physically abusive – but because of that, I moved to my dad's house because I just – I couldn't stand to be around him one more day. And when I moved to my dad's house, my dad just was a workaholic and never really paid attention. But we moved to Los Alamos where he lived in California, and he would just been married. So it's a Christmas before I turned 14. My birthday is February, and it's a tiny town that – I don't think has a stoplight, and the school is so small that sixth, seventh, and eighth graders are in the same classroom, so everybody knows everybody, and so the older kids hang out with the younger kids, so I decided, because they invited me to go hang out with them, but they, we, I had to sneak out to go do it, because it was at dark, we were going to go to the park. I was just very stupid, and I snuck out. He is 18, and he is the boyfriend of my friend's um, older sister. And so he met me out. Well, we had gone and hung out places before, so I completely trusted him, and I didn't really think that anything would happen. But I was very naive and didn't even understand. Like, I didn't even know what sex was. That is not a lie. Nobody explained sex to me. I didn't know the word penis. I had just started my period. My mother never even told me what that was. And typical Southern, no understanding of sex or anything that came along with, like, your female organs. So at any rate, I never kissed a boy. In the Right beside my house, there's a gravel driveway. And my bedroom and the windows are, like, right beside that. But there's, like, a fence. So at any rate, I, he raped me there, and I have very little memory of it, but I had this out-of-body experience where I physically saw my body below me. I was like – like I had an out-of-body experience. I like left my body so that I was not experiencing the trauma, and I remember feeling the gravel underneath me and it being very painful and completely not understanding what was even happening to me. And so after that, I thought – well, during the time, I was afraid to scream or say anything because I thought it was my fault because I snuck out, and I thought I was going to get in trouble. I don't remember what happened, leaving, how I got back in the house, nothing. I went, you know, on <laughs> clearly traumatized looking back, but just pretending it never happened, and I definitely acted out and pretended to be cool and I'd say misbehaved, but it was a normal response to someone who had been traumatized that hadn't dealt with it. So I never told a soul because I always thought it was my fault, and I always thought I'd get in trouble. And I was really ashamed, just I think typical of the time and also like how many times 
have I seen or heard about a woman being raped and she gets blamed for it? So I never told siblings, parents, no one until I was in my 20s. I would say even late 20s, maybe I was 25. So 10 years later, it took me to talk about it. And then 20 years later, to, to just talk about it freely and openly, like this is what happened to me and just realize it's not my fault. And I should not be ashamed. I had zero control over it. Even if I'd snuck out, that doesn't mean anybody had the right to do that to me. It was not my fault in any way whatsoever. How did those memories come back to you in your 20s? Were you in counseling or what happened? No, I did go to counseling. I started counseling when I was 19, but I did not talk about that even to my counselor. I went to counseling because I had been, I'd had terrible parents basically. And um, I started going to counseling. I, I was dealt with depression since I was eight years old. And so I started going to counseling because I was depressed. I don't remember how it came back or why I started talking about it, but I told my mom and I found out that my mom had been raped also. And she told me her story, which is way more horrific than mine. And I don't want to tell it because it's not my story to tell my sisters. It just it was so common at this point, but it still wasn't something I felt comfortable talking about to anybody. It was just like, I had to tell my mom, like, this is what happened to me. And I think part of what happened was my family had given me so much grief for how I behaved as a 13, 14, 15, 16 year old. Like I was this bad kid, which all I did was smoke weed. I wasn't even that bad. Now, my my children don't know I smoke weed, but I don't smoke now, but I did at the time. But that was just like how I coped. It was like how I dealt with the trauma. And it wasn't even like I smoked it all the time. It's just like once in a while I did. Mm -hmm. But my family thought that I was such a bad kid, and they talked about how awful I was. And I didn't even do anything, but I got so tired of hearing about what a bad kid I was. And now my mom didn't even say any of these things. My mother never said this. It was my stepmom and my father and his mother, my grandmother, my mother, like that side of my family did not talk about me in that way and didn't think of me in that way. But I just was so tired of it. I think I told my mom. I never even told my dad what happened until last year. And I'm 48. So I was 47. So it took me how many years? What was that? 36 years, 35 years? I can't do math at this time. 34 years to tell my dad what had happened. And again, it was because he still had this story about what an awful kid I was. And I got so sick of listening to him and my stepmom talk about, and I just took it for all those years. I just, they can think that. I know it's not true. I know the truth about me. I don't have the gut to tell them what happened. I don't want to talk about it. And then my stepmom got really sick and she passed away. And I regretted not telling her why I behaved the way I did, the story that she told about me, because I guess I was thinking I wanted to tell her because it would help her understand where I was coming from and have empathy for me. But I never told her because I thought, what point does they just, they're going to talk bad about me no matter what. I will say at the same time they have the story about me, she would tell me how proud of me she was and she loved me and she's proud of the things I'd accomplish in my work and just whatever. But they still had this story in their head. So finally, I got sick of my dad bad-mouthing me about it. And I said, Dad, do you know why I smoked weed and was so bad? I was raped outside the house, and I was too scared to to tell you and too scared to do anything. And I've been ashamed of myself and this happening to me for 35 years. And my dad was just white-faced. It shut him up, and now he doesn't talk about it anymore. And I regret not saying something. I think – the memories, really the full memories, did not come back until I went to counseling in my late 30s and 40s, and I would start getting depressed, and it always hit me the beginning of November, and I really didn't understand, and it was like severe depression, like hard for me to get out of bed, hard for me to function, like a headache, just, I mean, I still functioned, I still got up and ran, I still got up and did the things I had to do, but it was just so hard for me to do it. And then January would hit, and that was the worst of it. So while I was in counseling, and I didn't always necessarily talk about those things, but I think actually what happened was when I had a car accident and my concussion, 
what ha- it was like a severe traumatic it was a pretty bad concussion it was more like a traumatic brain injury and i had headaches for a whole year migraines like every single day and when part of your brain starts shutting down like the the bruising in your brain it was weird because it was like short term memory was gone but i had long term memories come back so things from the past i could remember it was weird because it's all the things i'd forgotten about well, I suddenly remember the date of when I was raped was January 11th, and it was like – it made sense to me why I was so depressed. It was like the PTSD and the trauma I was anticipating coming up to that time, and my body had the memory even if my brain didn't have the memory. Once I had that, I started remembering everything that happened. For me, I realized I didn't need to keep it private or secret. Like, what good did that do? And I think also the Me Too movement really helped me heal a lot and be upfront and frank about it. Now, I don't talk about it on social media or I haven't because I don't really have a good reason. I just haven't been that free, I guess, about it. But I don't, I, but I don't care who knows. Like I, my son yesterday said to me, there's a song and it's something, um, 1985 was a good year. And my son, he's 13. He's like, was that a good year for you, mom? And I said, no, actually it wasn't. I was raped when I was 13. And he's like, I didn't know that about you. Uh, and, you know, I told him the story. So I know I don't think he needs to know when he's like 10, 11, but he's 13, the same time it happened to me. And I pretty much have told all my kids that at that age, like, this is what happened to me. So that if something happens to them, I don't want them to feel scared or afraid, but I want them to feel like they can talk to me an open conversation because that's what was missing for me was people telling me it's okay to talk about your trauma and the environment changed so much that now that now women can feel free about it does that make sense yeah that's what the podcast is for fran it's Mm -hmm. it's it's all about i'm trying to make it okay to talk about rape and make and make I'm trying to do that without making rape acceptable, talking about rape without making it acceptable. How does this change how you raise your son? Like, do you um, talk to oh, well, all my You just told him yesterday. That's My 21-year-old knows. My almost 16-year-old knows. And once they get into middle school, I just feel like, like I, well, what changed is I want to be the best parent I possibly can be. And... At the same time, they don't need to know – they don't need to be traumatized through my trauma. This is my trauma, and so they get to get have their childhood. I have my childhood stolen. I'm not stealing their childhood from them. There's kids his age having sex. For me, them knowing that this is something that happens, but also you can be okay afterwards. And, yeah, you didn't need to know this about me, and I'm telling you now, but I feel – it's kind of like a transition into teenagehood that I really don't want to cross. Like I don't like having to telling those things. I don't like having to talk about it with him, but at the same time, I want him to know I'm not going to be ashamed. And these, this is terrible. But what was amazing to me, the conversation I had, he said, was he, did he go to jail? Is he in jail? And I said, no, he didn't go to jail. And, and he's just, he's very naive because he's, He's 13. He doesn't know. They don't understand how the world works. And I said, I didn't tell anybody. Well, why not? He should have gone to jail. I said, because, buddy, women are constantly blamed when they're raped. We're told it's our fault, and it's not our fault. So it was like it was really great to have that awakening so he could have awareness. And at the same time, sad. But he just moved on. You know, he's sad about it. I don't know how he feels about it, but when he wants to talk about it, he can have that conversation with me. I think what it, what it does as far as having sons is I've really tried to let them know you don't – you're not entitled to the female body. You are not – like – we're all equal. You get have to ask permission, which I don't think they would even assume my children aren't that, that way. Luckily, I'm married to a really kind, compassionate man who I could completely tell everything from day one. And like, he never judged me about anything. I never have hidden anything from him. He knew when we were dating all the trauma I'd been through. And he's just been very like, 
amazing about it all. And that has been very healing. So my children have had the experience of understanding how women should be treated through their father, but also witnessing what I expect and how I expect to be treated. So I think it changed the conversation for him to be aware, but I don't think it changed how I treat him or how I've raised him. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. You know, I've, I'll go ahead and, and like, it's happened to me several times. I've, I just, and, and talking to you is kind of like, un, you know, unveiled a few feelings that I have, but I'm thinking, wouldn't it have been crazy in high school if we'd all been open and honest with each other, if we had known what each other had gone through, how that would mm-hmm. have changed our lives? If this had even been a conversation in the 80s, the Me Too, if the Me Too movement had happened then, how would that have changed us? I'm so grateful the Me Too movement has happened because girls going forward, boys going forward because they get raped too, know that it's okay to talk about it. And so, wow, I'm just having a moment. <laughs> I'm sorry that's happened to you, and I'm sorry that we have to – I'm sorry for all women that we have to – and men, I'm sorry that this has to happen at all. Right. I'm also very sorry that it happened to you, and I really appreciate you sharing your story because I know that talking about it can be cathartic, but hearing about it when you're – when you've gone through it, when you hear someone else's story, that is also very healing. So I agree. sharing – Sharing your story is going to is gonna help some people, I hope. Now that you've heard the statistics and had a chance to digest the idea that our police departments, and not just Springfield police departments, we're talking all the police departments, Our police departments aren't the only thing we can blame for the many discriminating rationalizations for not calling the police after being raped. I'm sure there are quite a few people who wouldn't think twice about calling authorities about a sexual assault. Ideally, that's what you should do, right? In the next episode, we'll talk with a member of the Springfield community who was asked to join the sexual assault task force put together by the city council. And I want to cover the subject of shame. Shame seems to be a universal problem amongst victims. Why is that? What can be done about it? Find out on the next Rape the Podcast. Rape the Podcast is written by Julie Ballou and produced by Chick Evans. I'm Julie Ballou. Thank you for joining me for Rape the Podcast.